and ask if you are going to move a stoma, you have a parastomal hernia, you're now going to move the stoma to the other side, would you at that point put in some type of prophylactic mesh to try to prevent hernia formation or just make a new stoma? No. Until yet, we just put the new stoma because putting a prophylactic mesh uh, has, uh, can be dangerous if you don't need it. And you show that you show that the, the, the recurrence rate is lower than forty percent. And so, uh, I, I think that at the fr for just for the first time, uh, no prophylactic mesh, and we can repair and perhaps putting a mesh. Uh, if there is a recurrence that is occurring. Uh, I'm still in your cat and I have a question. Yes. Hello, um, Bernard Almagne. I'm not a colorectal surgeon, you know it. Um, but uh, as we have a, a quite good number of uh, young uh, surgeons around us, um, we, you say that preventing uh, para uh, stomal herniation uh, might uh, be the use of a mesh, but initially uh, regarding the uh, technique used to uh, create a stoma, it, are there some uh, obvious uh, uh, rules to respect, I mean the uh, subperitoneal uh, sub ch uh, channel or something like that? I know that uh, you have a large experience with uh, colorectal surgery, so how are you doing use stoma initially. Are you using a mesh or are you doing some uh, retroperitoneal channel or what, what are you doing? We, well, we just recently completed, and Dr. Bartzak will show the uh, results towards the end, we just recently completed a multi-center randomized controlled trial using a biologic mesh. Uh, it's an acellular uh, human uh, dermal platform. Mm -hmm. Um, called Stratus, which is a bit like Alloderm uh, from, from LifeCell. I yeah. mean, it's just one yeah. product. There's a lot of others out there. Permacol mm -hmm. is another one. Veritas is another that's similar from different companies. But these scaffolds, uh, we don't have the results yet, but we do know, and I don't want to steal Dr. Barsak's thunder, there was not an increase in complications in putting in the mesh. And this was Jim Fleshman, Dave Beck, uh, myself, mm -hmm. Neil Ellis, mm -hmm. and a bunch of others. So we do know from the early stage there's, there was no increase in, in complications. None of the mesh had to be removed in this randomized controlled trial. Um, the, C, the CAT scan follow-up results we don't yet have because we're looking both at clinical recurrence of hernia or clinical occurrence of hernia, plus we're looking at CT evidence, and we don't have that yet. So we've just completed the trial, but at the moment, like you, outside of the trial, we're just making a stoma de novo, and even if we were to relocate it, at present we're just relocating it, but we are rethinking the issue to maybe put in mesh. The problem with mesh is also the cost, that on that slide that Dr. Bartzak showed, per square centimeter, some of these things are like 20 euros for like a, you know, one square centimeter. It's more expensive than real estate in Paris, you know. And to put this <laughs> in a patient, you know, we have to make sure it's, it's worthwhile to do that. We don't yet, you know, we don't yet know that. Uh, so what we do is try and make a very small hole, not too small to cause occlusion, but two finger breaths maximal. I do not make a cruciate incision. I just make a, a vertical incision. I don't believe in the cruciate, just a vertical incision to bring out the stoma. We don't tack it, and no, I, I don't tunnel it. I don't do the Gallagher technique. I just bring it out straight. But I think the key is through the middle of the rectus muscle and in the iliac fossa. Um, part of the reason I think a lot of people get hernias is people tend to bring the stoma out in the lateral aspect of the rectus where it's weaker as opposed to through the middle. Um, or they bring it out very low in, in the rectus where it's um, uh, the pressure exerted is a little bit difficult, a little bit increased. That a lot of the placement of the stoma, really the majority of the placement, is up to the enterostomal therapist prior to surgery to see on the abdomen where it's going to best seat. So there's no real tricks beyond that, Bernard. I mean, it's fairly straightforward mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, of what we do. But we're, the main thing is, we're based on this study, we're, we are really seriously considering you know, prophylactic use. We'll see what the CAT scan results show.
Yeah, but it because, is next uh, to the question. Uh, uh, yeah, on the experience that we have had in the upper GI surgery using a biological mesh, you are aware of this multicenter trial done in the United States for large hyatolania. And uh, if initially they discovered a quite low rate of frequency compared to uh, the uh, conventional sutures at six months, uh, at five years for the latest results, they have a rate which is totally similar to suture. And the reason uh, is that when they go back in the patient, uh, they can't find any residual, residual tissue from the biological mesh. So the question today, at least in our field, is that biological mesh disappear. So that's a, a risk, and as you say, the cost is, is quite high. And uh, in the upper GI experience, in the quite good number of patients, we couldn't find any uh, sign of a mesh uh, that was placed initially. So it's quite strange with this uh, biological mesh. So what's your opinion about that? I think that is the argument that this particular company, LifeCell, has. And, you know, I'm, I'm a bit intrigued. And in the spirit of disclosure, I've worked as a consultant for them. I'm intrigued by the concept. They claim that their product allows tissue ingrowth as opposed to a lot of the other products which they claim, and, and histopathologically is good evidence, may have either an encapsulation phenomenon, like a breast prosthesis, which would then disappear, or just induces a foreign body response, which again would cause a phagocytosis and a lysis of the, the mesh. So over time, you're right. If, if the tissue that you're putting in, the biologic, causes a response in the body that causes it to either be digested or rejected, you're not going to see it. But if, in theory, and if they're correct, and if it allows for a scaffold for a tissue ingrowth, then you would see native tissue there five years later, and that may be the difference. Now, they did a study called uh, what was the name of the one? They just presented Ameri Rich, R-I-C-H. It was presented to the American College of Surgeons on general surgery, infected ventral incisional hernias with fistulas and things, and it seemed convincing uh, from that point of view. But you're right. It has to be a material that will either last or preferably allow normal tissue ingrowth. Um, let me, just in the interest of time, uh, 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 unless you had another question from IRCAD. Uh, otherwise, we return to Dr. Thank you. Uh, thank no, you. thank you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent points. I'm really glad that you're uh, online with us this morning. Okay. So this is the uh, uh, PRISM study that Dr. Uh, Wexner alluded to. Um, basically, uh, the Stratus group uh, had 53 patients control 63 patients. Um, you can see the indications here. And uh, again, there were well-matched groups with no difference among them, <clears throat> between them. Uh, basically, at early, uh, in early stages, at 30 days, there was uh, no difference uh, in early events, and no mesh was removed. So <clears throat> as we said, personal hernias are a uh, frequent problem uh, avoidance seems to me better than correction and early data seem to point to the fact that biologics may be better than synthetic meshes um, so in the future um, we're looking at the development of um, our better understanding of biologic mesh and um, as all and also its uh, uh, biology such as increased angiogenesis and incorporation rates so we'd like to <clears throat> just end our discussion with, uh, with a case presentation here from uh, Cleveland Clinic, Florida, uh, of a 41-year-old uh, male with history of ulcerative colitis who underwent restor restorative proctocolectomy with a diverting ileostomy, ended up having a perforation of the distal um, uh, portion of the loop ileostomy at an outside institution, um, underwent an exploratory laparotomy and ileostomy relocation, and uh, he was then referred to us. Um, <clears throat> during the first postoperative six months, the patient had persistent pelvic sepsis uh, with anastomotic strictures, but also developed a peristomal hernia at the time. Um, because of uh, his symptoms, he was taken to the operating room uh, and had both a uh, pouch excision, 
as well as a primary repair of peristomal hernia. Um, we could not relocate the uh, stoma at the time because of the uh, poor tissue on the other side uh, from previous surgeries. Then the patient represented uh, with what you can see on the CAT scan here as a herniation. This was 16 months later. Uh, he had a recurrence, uh, approximately 8.4 centimeter defect. And this time, a laparoscopic approach was used uh, with a sugar baker repair with uh, PTFE. Patient recovered well from surgery. However, he also returned to weightlifting uh, very quickly and presented again with a reducible peristomal hernia year later. Uh, the defect was lateral to the uh, stoma site, and this time a laparoscopic keyhole repair was used to uh, fashion the mesh around defect. Um, and more of the same, <laughs> the patient uh, was advised not to uh, overdo it, but uh, he did return to weightlifting and uh, represented uh, back in um, uh, earlier this year with a reducible peristomal uh, hernia. So, that, that case pretty well exemplifies some of the problems we have with these, you know, with these stomas, that they get a hernia, you do a direct repair, you do relocation, try sugar baker, try keyhole, you know, to some degree it's patient compliance. And this particular fellow is a retired professional athlete uh, who, when you talk about weightlifting, is, is like in the order of, you know, 180 kilogram bench pressing and, uh, or more and uh, really stressing it, so that's part of the problem. But what do you do at this point? Maybe we can turn to Johns Hopkins. Here's a guy who's had you know, a sugar baker repair, a keyhole repair. He's had hernia repairs on both sides. Where do we go with this guy? Send him to someone else. <laughs> this is gonna be a nightmare. And the fact that there are so many different approaches um, you know, you're just going to have to, in this case, try to find a good place. You're, you're not going to be able to relocate. That's already been, you know, I think your sights are shot. You're going to have to do the best you can with a single site, major reconstruction. You're probably going to have to use some kind of a mesh um, reinforcement, um, which does raise a question that I wanted to about the use of biologic for the Gallagher type sugar baker approach. We learn from both open abdominal wall hernias and from, as Dalamani re referred to in the foregut experience, that if you try to gap with biologics, they fail. And if I understand the Gallagher technique right, you're, you're using it free for part of that repair as a little bit of a sling. And I just, I'm not sure you're going to get incorporation with that, so I think it's going to fail just as a question that, that may occur. Um, but this could, the guy would be a nightmare to deal with, and I think I would try to do it at the site um, and probably with mesh reinforcement. Oh, you, you're correct. It is a nightmare, especially with a, a non-compliant uh, patient because you know whatever you do, it's, it's doomed to recur and, you know, kind of try a bit of everything. I, I've not used the uh, any biologic in a Gallagher sense because I'd be concerned as uh, Bernard you know as mentioned as Eric had mentioned that it's going to disappear so there's no reason that the stoma isn't just going to fall back I mean in theory even if there's tissue incorporation it, it shouldn't be used as a bridge but I think it's more of an overlay and the way we did the trial with the um, this biologic was just cutting a cruciate incision in the little square of, of, of uh, mesh and then laying it on top so the bowel came directly through it. So there's no gap. It's just direct apposition to the bowel and in a sublay position. So it was between the posterior sheath of the rectus and the rectus. So there's tissue all around it for ingrowth. You're right. If you just lay this and, and slap it against the peritoneum and sling it under the bowel, I mean, there's no reason that the bowel wouldn't just fall back at some time. I, I'd be concerned of that same thing. And I think if you were going to do it as a Gallagher type nick technique, you somehow have to do it in a sublay position. I think you're 100% correct. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any magic with this guy. The only thing I would add that might be a little different is because the other side, as you say, was 
shot, we made sure by CT, and uh, Dr. Uh, Barsak briefly showed that, but that there's no fascial defect on the contralateral side. And what we did do is have plastic surgery go and reconstruct uh, or resurface and recontour the abdominal wall on that side. So from the point of view externally of the skin, if we do elect to move his stoma, the fascia is intact and the abdomen now has a smooth surface so that we could evert the stoma. The problem with bringing it out through an old site for the younger surgeons uh, is obviously that you can get stool, particularly for an ileostomy, liquid stool seeping into crevices, make uh, an appliance seal very, very difficult, a lot of skin excretion. So we did take that prophylactic measure um, you know, during this hiatus while it's relatively asymptomatic and just leave the thing alone and resurface it. And that's an occasional trick you can pull out of your bag is to recycle the other side when you've run out of options. 